Just got to check one thing, Bob, and we'll be there. All right. Ladies and gentlemen, back live with Louis B. Free Radio Show, Brain Food from the Heartland. And I am so delighted and honored to have returning to the show, Robert Amsterdam. Bob, welcome. Good morning. Welcome back. Or good afternoon. Thanks. To you. Sorry. Thanks so much for having me. I'm I'm always always honored, always delighted to have you on. So uh, I I want to start, if you will, about your background. I've got all I've got copious notes around here of all the things that you've done, literally around the world. So well, I, I've been a lawyer for a very very long time, and the nature of our practice is such that uh, I've been privileged to some to act for some very interesting people. So we. As you know, we we represented the red shirts during the revolution in Bangkok in 2010. We represented uh, Putin's main adversary, Mikhail Khodorkovsky, in the Yukos case, 2003 to 2010, seven years. And uh, since then, we've done, you know, as, as most lawyers do, a large amount of litigation, but also. Um, a lot of pro bono work representing uh, political leaders uh, throughout the world when they get into trouble or jail. So we, uh, you know, very sadly uh, were retained by uh, the Holy Synod of the Ukraine Orthodox Church uh, as they faced uh, essentially a ban and the destruction of a thousand year old church by the Ukrainian authorities. How did you get involved with that? How did that come about? Well, we were we were hired by an individual in Ukraine who was very involved in the church and who was sanctioned, basically meaning that his his assets were frozen by the state, and they were frozen because of his relationship to the church. And I I found that very hard to believe because you don't don't run across that very often. And uh, after getting into it quite deeply and meeting and talking to some of the members of the church, uh, a number of people requested that I act for the church. And then they brought it to what's called the Holy Synod, which is, I think, a, a Congress of the church elders, and they retained me. I've got to ask you, what drives you to do this type of work? Because it's very dangerous. You've had, I don't know if you want to recount the the some of the issues you've had and your team has had in, in Russia, but this is it can be extremely dangerous work and you push forward. What drives well, you? Well, look, I mean, Louis, as I think you're aware, you reach a certain age where those kinds of concerns become uh, of less import. And I, I honestly think uh, as you know, uh, I was a high school dropout. I have never uh, sort of towed the easy path in anything and uh, uh, am not very interested in shareholder disputes. I, I'm interested in uh, cases that are important uh, from a geopolitical perspective. I mean, I have a, a podcast called Departures. It's wonderful. We've, we've had almost 200 episodes on there covering geopolitics, often interviews with leading experts. That's that interplay between politics and the law has driven me for many, many years. I, I, I'm going to push just a little more, if you don't mind, but where, where that drive to do that, to not do. Well, I mean, or, I've been. A I've been a political junkie since I was a child. I was in the Soviet Union as it then was when I was 16 for the first time. I was in uh, Nigeria uh, at 16. I I've been very involved in Africa all my life. Um, uh, it's always a funny story with my African friends because I've always grown up half thinking I was African because I have spent so much time uh, in Africa fighting for various causes, um, 
been blessed to represent some of the most interesting uh, leaders in Africa. And uh, today, privileged to act uh, for the uh, Democratic Republic of Congo, privileged to act for uh, Bobby Wine in his, in his heroic uh, fight uh, to claim the presidency that he won in the last election in Uganda, a uh, privilege to act for Tundu Lisu in Tanzania. I mean, I can go on and on. We have a, we have a large pro bono practice. Uh, in 2013, we took on the United Nations for some misbehavior in Africa, and we, uh, we got two assistant secretary generals uh, disciplined. Um, Good. So it, it's uh, unfortunately cost me a number of marriages. Um, but uh, outside of that, it, you know, it's been a, a great ride and the ride continues. And this church case is fascinating because it's the first, well, I won't say the first time, it's one of the few times I've run up against a complete stone wall of Western media, uninterested in covering this. Yeah. That's, that's one of the things Bob, that I that confounds me because when I first learned about it, I'm thinking, and I'm I watch uh, news, I read, uh, I just I, you know, and I again I check them all out from the left media, the right media. Uh, I used to trust the BBC, not so much anymore. Uh, but they, I, I'm reading in the in the newspapers, etc. What is it with Western? First, a little bit of more background, and then let's get into the lack of media coverage. And by the way, you did do a show with Tucker Carlson that had way well over 50 million views. Yeah, we were very surprised. Uh, but I think I think it's a reflection. Uh, firstly, I know that Tucker is 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 not liked by many, but I admire him for taking on difficult matters that don't get the attention they deserve. And I think this church case is one of them. He was the first person in the US to ride this issue uh, almost uh, six or eight months ago. He took, on, took it on with Vice President, uh, the former Vice President who, uh, who basically said that, that he had no knowledge of it. Um, essentially, the United States has decided that everything that happens in Ukraine we're going to buy the Ukrainian version of events, and mm -hmm. we're simply we're, we're, we have to paint them as heroes, and it doesn't matter what the truth is. And and in this case, we are sacrificing an important Christian church, and uh, I can't believe it. I can't believe in a country that uh, you have many you know many Christians. And many people who are evangelicals and take the church seriously, I can't believe that it is to me to try to raise awareness of this this crime against Christianity, because that's what it is. When you shut down a church, uh, and, and let me be very, very clear, uh, my clients are no more Russian than the average Ukrainian, sure, there have been members of the church that uh, were complicit with Russia, just like there were members of the Ukrainian secret police that were complicit, just like there were members of the Ukrainian parliament that were complicit. No more, no less than the average. And the idea that you use this ridiculous reason to shut Jesus Christ out of their lives, and that's what they're doing. They're going to tell you, well, we have a state church, but... It is a church in a different language, uh, with different leadership, with a different liturgy. And, and you and I are both on the far side of 40 to be charitable. Uh, and, that's very charitable. And, and for us, whatever our faith, uh, how you deal with your God is a very intimate issue. Yes. And... If somebody came into my synagogue, because I'm Jewish, somebody came into it's my not. synagogue and said, you're not allowed to worship in Hebrew, we're changing the language to Arabic, and that rabbi is no longer your rabbi, we're going to put someone else there, I would object. And that's what the Ukrainians have done. And let me, let me tell you, violently, 
We're talking about jailed priests. We're talking about kidnapped priests. We're talking about violence, beatings, thefts of, of churches. It is unimaginable what this church has gone through at the hands of, quote, democratic, close quote, Ukraine. And the media in this country is... Silence. 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 Absolute. Let me tell you, I did an interview with a, a British paper. I'm not going to mention the name. All they wanted to know um, was who's paying you? Because the only interest they have is to try to find out if you're some sort of Russian lackey. And I think the reason the church has hired me is I am one of the few lawyers who is completely banned from Russia. So I was I was arrested in Moscow in 2005. Oh. Two of my good friends were killed over the next year in Moscow. So nobody can make the allegation that I'm a puppet for Mr. Putin. But um, I'll tell you, every other lawyer would have been afraid to take the case because the Ukrainians will tell you that any critic of theirs is you know, a Putin lackey. So it, it is impossible to challenge the Ukrainians because you're you might, if you're challenging them, you're on Putin's side. And, and I'm just disgusted with with that argument. And I'm I'm horrified that the U.S. government seems to have bought it hook, line, and sinker. And and uh, when we I'm in uh, Washington next week, approaching members of Congress. And it's incredible how many uh, congressmen, their gatekeepers say, oh, those are Russian sympathizers. We don't want to meet you. I mean, we, we have a cancel culture in this country that's incredibly dangerous for um, just, just incredibly dangerous for uh, the growth of an intelligent discourse not only on Ukraine, but on uh, every issue out there. It, and it's scary to me. It's, it's, it's really scary to me that how people will don't, and I've said this before, uh, Robert Amsterdam, that when, when I have, if there's a story that's interesting to me, I, I'll get obsessive about kind of tracking down the facts because I have such a concern about other media outlets um not twisting not telling all the facts whatever having an agenda and it's all it's not always easy to track those down so you know, i'm very skeptical very skeptical and the fact that they're keeping this out that they are not recognizing this really horrifies me no and and me as well and uh it is you know, we have written to every member of the Ukrainian Rada, their parliament, to warn them and say outlawing, banning a religion is contrary to international human rights law. It's contrary to the criteria that would allow you to join the European Union. And you individually could be liable to sanctions. So we've written that to every, every member of the Rada uh, to put them on notice as to the cost of their behavior. Give us a little bit more of the background. I may have moved too, too quickly with this. How did this all come about in Ukraine? So uh, there has been a drive for an autocephalous, sort of autonomous church in Ukraine since the Bolshevik Revolution, since 1917. Uh, and there have been various attempts at it because there has been constant tension between Ukraine and Russia. As you know, a low-grade war began in 2014, turning into a high-grade war in 2022. And Ukrainian nationalism is something that, that has been growing and congealing as a result of the warfare with Russia. And a president of Ukraine, by the name of Poroshenko, um, believed it was in his political interest to establish, if you will, a national 
autocephalous church, a church independent of the Moscow patriarch, because until 2018, the key religion was that of my clients, the Ukrainian Orthodox Church with its thousand year history. There were other breakaway schismatic churches, but our church was clearly in the ascendancy. And the this political leader Poroshenko made it a political issue to get a national church. And he went to uh, the uh, Patriarch of Constantinople and obtained what's called a tomos, which is the sort of license from that body to uh, establish a, uh, an autocephalous or autonomous church, which my client's church believes was contrary to canon law. And in any event, they established that church, I think formally in January of 2019, with the undertaking that the establishment of this church would in no way impact on freedom of religion. Uh, this proceeded until uh, the acceleration of the war in 2022, uh, at which point uh, our church cut its ties to the Moscow Patriarchate as well. Uh, and the uh, Zelensky government, in its wisdom, decided to replace a very fair-minded leader of what's called ethnopolitics and religion with a, a bureaucrat who was much less fair-minded and uh, his name is Yelensky and he has made it his life's mission to basically drive our church into the ground and they have begun it in many different ways one way is similar to what's called corporate raiding, where you basically steal assets, uh, come up with a phony register of congregants, and then change the jurisdiction of the particular church. Another way is through the SBU, the secret police, where you interrogate and demean these religious followers. 41 thousand members of the church have been interrogated by the secret police. 41,000. 41,000. Uh, again, not a word out of the United States, not a word out of a Christian leader about this persecution. I, I, I'm i still struggling to figure out why. I, I still don't. Where are the well, Christian because, leaders in this country? We are in a 1984 McCarthyite period where we are being mobilized to hate Russia, everything about Russia. And therefore, because we have to hate Russia, because law firms set up committees to make sure that people with Russian sounding names are no longer working with the firm, because we are doing this, uh, it is unpalatable to speak out on behalf of people who are accused of being sympathetic to Russia. That's how dangerous and crazy our world is today. And that was before the Gaza war and everything else that's going on. When you started to do the, again, when I'm looking, when I was reading and I would urge people to go to your website, robertamsterdam.com and read some of the, the uh, pieces that you've got, it's just it's a, a, a ter it's terrifying about how this is happening and seems to be happening without and I'm thrilled that you're you're involved. It seems to be happening. I repeat again with no international recognition. I I don't understand. Uh, I don't under I fail to understand. I understand what you're saying about 1984. It's frightening. And, and, you know, in fairness, the UN has spoken out, the World Council of Churches has spoken out, but none of our democratic leaders have the guts to speak out um, because everybody's captured, um, everybody's captured by the political narrative 
And since we've given Ukraine $70 billion and we look like schmucks when they act in this way, let's just avoid it. And, oh. and you know, I have to say, Christian leaders, you know, it's very difficult. I'm a non-Christian to reach out to these Christian leaders because I certainly, I don't know them. But Christian leaders should speak out because these are your brothers and sisters being beaten to a pulp in Ukraine in front of you. It makes me think of in every studio that I've I've worked in over the last uh, wow twenty five years. I I always have the Pastor Niemöller quote when, been I know there's been different versions of it. If well, first they came for. Then they came for me and I did not stand up and I did not stand up. And then they came for me and there was no one left to stand up for me. If I, and I think about that all the time about standing up for, for others. I don't, again, don't understand um, why the Christian churches in the United States aren't pushing. They've got to have media contacts to get this out more. I, you know, I, I just, I fail to understand it. And I love the fact that you're doing what you're doing. Can you tell us a little bit about how that's coming for you and how you're doing that? Well, it's difficult because, um, as I said, you can't, firstly, the media now is obsessed as they should be with what's going on in the Mideast. Sure. Um, <clears throat> and the Ukrainians have very cynically rushed this vote so that you know the rest of the world is focused on other things. And they may formally ban the church next week. I mean, we have no idea. We have very little time. I am flying to Washington tomorrow to uh, try to meet with people in Congress. We're sending out a letter today to every congressman. And if there's any, any people, any, any Christians or non-Christians, uh, who care about this issue, please call your congressional office uh, because we're trying to get some attention for this with uh, very little luck. Yeah, I, I certainly hope you'll hear back from, you're sending out the letter today, correct? Yes, yeah. So uh, I'll be interested to hear what kind of response you get. You're gonna be in Washington so tomorrow uh, trying to get Tell us a little bit more about your visit to Washington tomorrow. Well, we, we um, outside of Tucker Carlson, uh, money was put together to buy a full page ad in the Washington Wall Street Journal, which put in there a letter from me to each member of the RADA talking about their violation of human rights. And uh, we're hoping to meet with uh, We've written a letter to 535 members of Congress and the Senate, and, and we're hoping to uh, have some meetings and uh, inspire, we hope, a handful of people to write to President Zelensky and uh, members of the RADA to stop this persecution. The idea of what's going on, I, I know I'm repeating myself a bit with this attack on the church in Ukraine, the Christians in Ukraine, when you're saying 41,000 uh, uh, by the secret, by the, I just, I'm, I'm, I'm horrified and so disappointed with our, our media. I understand the focus on the Middle East, on Israel, God. I understand that there's a lot of other pieces in the news that I see that are I dare say fluff pieces, whatever, or easy, easy stories. And this is one that people need to, they need to dig down on and get us notice, notice uh, and people to, to do what? People to do what? To, to listen, to, to contact uh, their religious leaders and members of Congress to say, and I don't care whether you're a Muslim and you go to your imam or you're Jewish and you go to your rabbi or you're a Christian and you go, to your priest or minister, uh, what's going on is wrong. We have leverage over Ukraine. They want more resources. Yes. They want more money. This is the time we should say, give up this, you know, call the seats fire on Christ. Let's let's stop yeah. fighting Christ and, and fight the Russians. 
but yeah, taking on taking on believers uh, at this level and with this ferocity is completely unacceptable in 2023 in Europe. And when you think, Bob Amsterdam, about the all the the billions of dollars that go, and I know people that are very supportive still wonder about the accountability and that sort of that money of those monies, if you will. And I still feel that I know that we could have some sway over what's going on with the Ukrainian urge with the dollars that they are asking for. Well, let, let me be very clear, Louis. Do I still have a few minutes? Oh, please. I've got, Bob, I've got time. I've got time. I know I'm... Let, 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 me, let me be clear. The fact is the Ukrainian political leadership think they have impunity. They think they can basically carry on without oversight. And one of the issues we all know is that before the war, next to Russia, Ukraine was one of the most corrupt countries on earth. And this raid on the church, this illegal raid on the church, in connection with the illegal sanctioning of people who are Ukrainian, who should not be sanctioned. And let me assure you, the reason they're sanctioning is because they have no evidence to go after these people. So they want to sanction them as opposed to charge them criminally. And when, in respect to the metropolitans, these high, high priests, if you will, of the Orthodox Church, when they've gone after them, it's very clear that they have planted evidence I have uh, one Metropolitan, a famous composer. He is 75 years old. That's even older than you and I. Yeah, not not. I'm I'm pretty sure I'm older than you. It's just a he's just a five years older. <laughs> Go ahead. But in any event, um, 75 years old, and he was just given a five year sentence. And and what was he given a five year sentence for? for finding a flyer on his computer. And even after the court knew that the flyer was put on the computer six days after the computer was taken from this man, they still sentenced him to five years in jail. So I don't have to tell you what it would mean if you or I got five years in jail. It doesn't, it doesn't leave a lot of time for uh, the rest of your life to, uh, you know, to, to enjoy life. So it's, these are merciless, yeah. unremitting attacks on men of the cloth. <coughs> and, and people without a voice, yeah. because they can't say anything because nobody's listening in Ukraine. They've cut off the newspapers. There's no dissent in Ukraine. So not only is there no dissent there, but here they've exported this mentality of no criticism. So we, we are, uh, in some ways, a vassal of Ukraine. Now we have uh, in the House many Republicans who don't want to support Ukraine, but um, none of them, from what I see, base that on conduct of the Ukrainians. It's more based on American, um, Money. you know, American budget issues. Yeah. <clears throat> but I'm saying this, this should definitely be an issue that is absolutely at the top of our agenda with Ukraine. And, and, and let me be clear, I am for supporting Ukraine. I believe the battle is existential. I am uh, you know, the last one who is gonna say uh, stops funding. But what I am gonna say is there's gotta be accountability. Yes. They've gotta end corruption and they've gotta stop attacking the church. And it shouldn't be a big order. It should not be a big order. And if they want to say that our church 
is somehow tainted by Russia, prove it, because they can't. Mm -hmm. And even, by the way, if they could, it wouldn't be legal to ban them. What you have to do is you actually have to investigate it and charge people, and, and not with the BS charges they've come up with, real charges show people conspiring with Russia, and they haven't done any of that because they have no evidence because this is a completely phony campaign, a merciless campaign against people who are religious and unprotected and whose only crime is being people of faith. It is absolutely disgusting that in the United States, these poor people of faith have no representation. No member of Congress is speaking out who cares about the Bible. All of these politicians say they care about the Bible. They care about religion. Where are they? Where are they on this fundamental issue that is at its core about Christianity? You've got some Jewish lawyer arguing. It's ridiculous. Where, where are the Christian leadership in the United States who should be taking a lead role in defending worshipers of Christ? I, I just fail to believe it. When, Bob, when <laughs> they've got publications, or certainly there's websites, et cetera. Uh, there's ways to get the word out amongst the Christian community in the United States, and it's just not being done. Well, that's right. I, and again, I, I failed to understand it. I, I can't comprehend it. Well, uh, Louis, I, I'm very grateful you've given me the time you have. Um, and, uh, you know, all I can say is thank you. You're one of the few people who have allowed us to get That's on right. and talk about. It. So, uh, again, we can do we need to get in touch with Congress. We need to get in touch with our senators, we need to get in touch with them and urge them to meet with you, urge them to look into this. I mean, if it, if, it, if it can be done, that's fine. But I think more importantly, urge them to get on the phone and write letters. We need the, the Parliament of Ukraine, the RADA, to know that Americans are unhappy with their attack on the church. That's the key thing. I mean, you know, as far as I'm concerned, if we could make it clear that it is unacceptable to take U.S. money and use it to interrogate priests, priests. that would be very yeah. helpful. That Which is outrageous. It all developed. Can you give us a little bit more? I'm getting a number of emails about it. Developed how? Again, I know we spoke briefly about it earlier. How did this all come about? And again, why? If you don't mind. Listen, it, it all it all came about because of a politician named Poroshenko who decided to make uh, religion, along with nap with language, a critical issue for his reelection campaign. But in fairness to him, he promised there would be no discrimination against our church. But Zelensky has failed us. Uh, Zelensky and oh, yeah. his acolytes who seem to think that uh, this closure of the church will give them points uh, with the domestic voting populace. I, I just, I again, I, I, don't, I don't understand it, but I would hope. And by the way, we've got the, you can go to the website, robertamsterdam.com, law targeting. The Ukrainian Orthodox Church is a disgraceful transgression of civil rights. Please get involved, folks. This is really, really, really important. Check out your podcast. At some point, you know, I know you had, uh, you did one recently. I'm not, I'm not going to digress at this point, but a dispatch from Israel and and things that you are very courageous. I, I find you, as I have since we first spoke and when I first started to learn about you incredibly courageous incredibly courageous you see people being kidnapped and in your past and what's happened and how you escaped an assassination attempt extremely courageous just i i know maybe it's weird to ask where does that come from 
you, because you've got that incredible I mean, I, I think, and courage. I think, I think if you have any men who have been through divorce, I've been divorced three times. So when you've been divorced three times, you realize that a hail of bullets is nothing compared to the pain of these types of procedures. So that, that may be part of the courage because I'm always mm -hmm. running away from something. So, um, look, uh, we'd be, we're very grateful for the attention that's been given to this case by you. And as I said, I hope your, your listeners will, will jump onto this. And check out the website. We've got all the links up at WeFreeShow.com, WFMJ.com, et cetera. Just go to RobertAmsterdam.com and check it out and get involved. Bob, I'm I'm so grateful. And thank you for the kind, the complimentary words. I'm I'm here. I would love to catch up with you down the road a little bit and and check in again. Uh, you're not going to get 50 million views from me. I'm sorry. <laughs> but uh, ha having you done that, and again, I that you agreed to come on. I'm grateful. I'm grateful. No, I'm, I'm very grateful to both you and Candy. So thank you so much. And I'm grateful for who you are in and for our world. Thanks well, so much. Thank so Thanks so much. Incredible guy, folks. Again, I want to tell you that if you go to the websites, go to the websites because